say I need you, but then you'd realize that I want you, just like a thousand other guys would say they love you, with all the rest of their lives, when all they wanted was to touch your face, your hands, and gaze into your eyes. Good afternoon. Hear the words of grace for our gathering together. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And because I live, you also shall live. To know Ruth Ann Butendorf is to know that these words were a part of the very foundation of her Christian faith. And we've gathered this afternoon to celebrate Ruth's beautiful lived life. Her love and her devotion for her husband, her daughter Anne, her son-in-law David, and grandchildren Allison and Julia did not diminish the love that would come later with her exchange daughter Sana and her family. But the truth is, and you know it to be the truth because you experienced it, Ruth's siblings, her nieces, her nephews, her extended family, and so many friends and so many colleagues experienced her love, her care, and her happy humor. Whatever circle she found herself in, she felt at home, 
whether it was at school, in her own home or church, any organization, she soon could become a strong participant, an amazing teacher, and a creative and fun-loving woman. And you remember those years of her life when she was exactly that. She lived with zest. She lived with vigor for as long as she was able. It's been difficult to say goodbye to this vital person because we, she's taken a bit of our hearts with her because we loved her, we appreciated her in all the moments of her life. We needed her in our life. But today we will say goodbye. Let's pray. Holy and ever creating God, you breathe the spirit of life into us. And then when our bodies can no longer sustain us, you receive back that spirit of life. Throughout our lives, you've known us fully. You've heard our prayers. We've leaned on you during the shadow moments and our painful and grieving times in life. Still today, we struggle to find the meaning of our loss. We ask, O oh God, that each family member and friend gathered here will experience your comfort and love in the days and months, even years ahead. Enable us all to see a glimpse of the light of your eternity and know that nothing in all creation can separate us from your unfailing love as we know it in Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. I've chosen a, a scripture that offers many of these same words, but it's a piece of comfort for all of us. It comes from Romans 8, verses 35 to 39. And you know it so well, you can almost say it with me, and you may if you like. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God as we know it in Jesus. We have the delightful opportunity, Rick, now to um, hear of three people who know Ruth very well in their life, and they want to speak about that. Ruth Prescott, Carla Beth Hitchcock, and Joan Jensen. And we invite them to come in the order that they choose. Is Ruth going to begin for us? my goodness talk about impacting so many people's lives this is just quite an amazing turnout for our dear friend Ruth how does one fit a 70 year friendship <sighs> into a few into just a few words I'm gonna try I used to kid Ruth that I was named after her the de Konings belonged to our Savior's Lutheran Church in Muskegon, and my father was the pastor. My parents named their children after people in the Bible, and in 1947, there were John, David, Mary, and Philip. If they had a girl as their fifth child, her name would be Ruth. Blanche and Gary threw a wrench into that plan <laughs> because they named their daughter Ruth who was born on June 27th. My parents were in a quandary. Could there be two baby Ruths in the church? <laughs> they met Blanche and Gary to ask permission to
to name their daughter Ruth if the baby was a girl? Obviously, the answer was yes, and I was born on December 12th. We moved to Chicago when I was five, and it wasn't until my brother Phil and I went to Casnovia, Michigan the summer I was seven to spend two weeks at his godparents' farm, Magnus and Mary Deerdahl. They were also members at Our Saviors. They had no children, so they invited the Christophers and the, the Konings up for the day so we would have kids to play with. I was invited to spend the night at the de Konings and Ruth and I bonded. Growing up, we only saw one another once during the summer. She either came to Chicago or I went to Muskegon. We wrote one letter a year and we never talked on the phone because as those of us in our age group know, long distance calls were really expensive. We stayed friends as we went to college, met our spouses, and had children. Rob, Ruth, Rick, and I traveled through Europe and the U.S. We shared our joys in having children and grandchildren, mourned when Ruth had two miscarriages and our parents died. We celebrated our 50th wedding anniversaries, and we had 47 Thanksgiving dinners together. We look forward to having more adventures, but as we know, life doesn't always turn out as we want. Ruth was one of the funniest people I knew. She could make me laugh until my stomach hurt. Her humor was self-deprecating, and many of the stories she told were about her. My favorite involves one of her fourth grade boys coming to her desk to ask for help. She stood and looked at Mrs. B for a moment, and then said, so Mrs. Butendorf, when did you decide to grow a mustache? <laughs> <laughs> she saw only humor in that. She was not insulted. She was also smart, but I don't think she ever thought of herself that way. She was an exemplary teacher, and when she retired from the classroom, she worked for the ISD and presented at teachers' workshops and conferences. When asked what she presented on, she went into detail about what she was doing and showed a depth of knowledge that blew me away. Besides having an incredible sense of humor, Ruth was a gifted writer. She could have been the next Irma Bombeck for those old of uh, you to know who she was. Humor was seamlessly woven into her writing and perfectly captured the es essence of those lucky enough to be the subject. In 2008, Ruth and I traveled to Hilton Head, South Carolina to spend a week with my sister and three of her college friends. They had graduated from R Luther College in 1965, so they had not really spent any time together in over 40 years. We spent the week sightseeing, laughing, having deep philosophical conversations, laughing, eating, laughing, you get the picture. On our last night together, Ruth shared what her predictions were for each of the women and how their lives were changed at the Luther reunion. I'd like to read two of her predictions. Please understand that Ruth did not know these women, except my sister, before that for those four days we spent together. She learned a lot listening and asking questions. So the first one I'm going to read about is Gail. Gail was about five foot two if she wore high heels and wore thick socks. Her husband was six foot seven. <laughs> now I'm telling you this because their height is referenced in this. Gail. Oh, and it's this, the, the piece is called The Luther Girls, The Later Years. Driving back to Tallahassee, Florida, Gail had also thought about her old friends. Yikes, she thought, we are all getting old and life comes at you fast. She thought about all of the engineers she had met and what they knew and what they didn't know. Come to think of it, she knew as much or as more than they did. She could be a civil engineer. First, she was civil. <laughs> and she had been listening to engineers be taught engineering for years. Good grief, it was just about bridges and roads and such. She had crossed many bridges in her life 
and driven on many roads. She had access to drawing boards and math tools. She had spanned decades. She surely could de design a bridge with a span. She could climb up on Bob's shoulders and measure the heights of ships in order to know how high to build the bridge. <laughs> By the time she reached home, she made her plans and was ready to take on the engineering world. From the get-go, Gail was a success. Not only did she get to be an engineer, she always remained civil. <laughs> Not only did she design highways across Florida, she was presently designing a bridge to the Bahamas from Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> she and Bob have measured ships and masts. She is presently designing the length of the spans and is ordering concrete for the bridge footings. She's also being busy being escorted in a gold Lincoln town car, fondly known as the Pimp Mobile, <laughs> and is speaking at engineering conventions across this nation. If you want to catch a glimpse of this busy woman, she's usually wearing lots of heavy gold jewelry. You can me email her at damngoodandcivil.com. <laughs> the next one is about Mike. Now her name was Michael, and it's obviously that her parents didn't have an alternate name if she was born a girl. <laughs> she was a PhD in um, education administration and was the principal at his uh, middle school in Oklahoma. Since Mike had an extra day to spend in the low country, she had time to ponder the long awaited reunion that had transpired over the past few days. After all, she was a doctor a PhD. She could indeed ponder and transpire all she wanted. She hearkened back to the days at Luther College and the friends she had met so long ago. They had inspired her. Could she inspire her middle school students? How could she make a difference in Oklahoma? Oklahoma. I'm going off script right now. If you have never seen the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical Oklahoma, I advise you to go and on the 750,000 cable channels that we all get, I'm sure you'll find it, or you can look at, you can watch it on one of the streaming services. For those of you who are familiar with it, you will see how she just beautifully weaves in the lyrics and makes them her own in this piece. Well, of course, she thought, Oklahoma, O-K-A-L-H-O-M-A, Oklahoma, Homa, Homa, when the mornings are beautiful and the corn is as high as an elephant's eye, she would revive the school for her middle school students. Everyone could take part. They would sing and study Oklahoma. They would learn what calico is. They would learn that everything is up to date in Kansas City because they've gone about as far as they could go. They would they could write papers comparing their aunts to Aunt Eller. They could learn about old Jed and why he's dead with a candle neath his head. The costumes could be designed and sewn by students. The artsy kids could design sets and farmers and the, and the farmers and the cowmans could learn to be friends. A classic art imitating life. Oh, the lessons to learn are endless and extend across the curriculum. What a success it was. Everybody participated. Everybody learned their parts and sang the songs. The school was harmonious and they all had profoundly changed due to one musical uh, about one state and one time in their history. They really had found themselves and so had Mike. Today Mike is working uh, in schools across O-K-A-L-H-O-M-A, -A, raising awareness of Oklahoma history and making a profound difference in teachers and students. Mike is busy, but she can be reached at thefarmerandcowmanshouldbefriends.com. <laughs> she is the loving wife to Bob, devoted mother to Anne, a grandmother to Alice and Julia, whom she loved from the bottom of her heart. And she is the mother -in -law, was the mother-in-law to her favorite son-in-law, David. Her sisters, Joan, Judy, Carla, Nan, and her brother, Joe, love her dearly as she did them. Family get-togethers will not be the same without her laughter and her humor. She also had many nieces, nephews, and grandnieces and nephews. 
She was a friend to many and brought kindness, love, and laughter to all who knew her. On a side note, Rick and I were in Barcelona, Spain on the day we learned that she had died. We went into a souvenir shop and on the counter was a carousel and on the carousel were these name tags. I went up to look at it and the name on the top was in a big circle with the name of the designer. The name of the designer was Ruth. This is her name, not mine. Ruth, thank you for being my friend. I will miss you terribly, but you are now free from this horrible, debilitating disease. Rest in peace, dear friend. Well, this is hard. I'm Carla, Ruth's younger sister. When Bob and Ann asked me to speak for our family, my first thought was, where do I begin? And of course, the beginning is where you begin. And the beginning is the family into which Ruth Ann was born. Waiting for her to arrive was our oldest sister, Joan Mary. She is our leader, our great wit, and the one who shows us how to live. <laughs> Judith Grace was second. She's the keeper of the flame. All things mom and dad. Next was Joseph Gordon, the close to Ruth in age and probably her first playmate and our historian. Ruth was the baby of that group, adored by them, and maybe dad's favorite. Eight years later, our family was perfected by my arrival. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> and soon after, Nan Gale, our rock, the one who figures it all out and gets it done. Mom and dad, Gary and Bunk, to many of you, supplied us with all we needed to grow up decently happy and with firm ties to each other. The in-laws that came after added more fun and they all found a place in the group. And just like the order of births, Ruth was very much in the center. And that is the role that she had in our family. She was the center of it all. She was our daughter and sister and aunt. And due to my youth, I was not witness to some of this, but I heard it from my older sisters and brothers, so I know it's true. <laughs> Ruth was a cute little girl and very fussy about her socks. There could be no wrinkles anywhere, and she was serious. Her cries of, there is a wrinkle in it, struck terror in the whole family as there would be no peace until everything was smoothed out. I don't know how, but my own daughter was also the same. I think it should have been Anne who did that, but it was my daughter. Ruth was very worried about being kidnapped and held for ransom. <laughs> Mom finally explained to her that we were poor. <laughs> so that problem was solved. <laughs> she was pretty sure she could sing like Teresa Brewer. I don't know who that is, but Ruth really wanted to sound like her and asked for confirmation from Judy and Joan quite frequently. I'm not sure if she measured up to Teresa, but she was good. She had her own friend that no one else ever saw. His name was Bobby Olson. And she would point out where he lived with his mother, Phyllis Horn. It, it was always one of the nicest places in town. She was taken very seriously and mom set an extra plate at the table the crowded table for Bobby if he was staying for dinner. <laughs> Eventually he disappeared. There was some drama as we grew up. She could slam a bedroom door as well as the rest of us. Dad would just shake his head and she got over it pretty quickly. Nan and I, Nan and I were able to watch and learn as Ruth negotiated high school and friendships. 
she told us about the birds and the bees. We didn't believe her. <laughs> she watched out for us in many ways. When I was in college and heading for a semester in England, Ruth and Ruth purchased a set of Samsonite luggage for me. It was yellow and it was really beautiful. I hadn't even figured out that I would need luggage to get to England, but there it was. And I think Bob had something to do with that too, and I'm still so grateful. As the youngest of my parents' grandchildren, Julie, Lindsay, Phil, and Charlotte, entered elementary school, Ruth invited them to Camp Aunt Ruth. Every year for maybe three or four years, they would go up to Ruth's where they would spend a few days playing with cousins, doing crafts, and having fun. They still talk about it very fondly. As adults, we five sisters embarked on quite a few sister trips planned primarily by Ruth. Ruth was really good at finding places to go and have an adventure, and off we'd go in the car, the five of us, sometimes four of us, sometimes three. We'd all have maps in our lap <laughs> as we would go on the road to maybe the, United, the Upper Peninsula, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and other places. As Ruth mentioned, she was a dedicated teacher. She probably taught over 800 kids. Some of those kids were the children of her students. She laughed a lot with them, and I think it was one of the secrets to her success. She could laugh at herself. She was part of it. She saw herself as part of it. Ruth told you about the, the youngster who asked why she was growing a mustache. There's a couple other things. One time the class was being a little bit boisterous, I guess we could say, and Ruth got very firm. She said, I want this stopping talked. <laughs> and that's so Ruth, so much like a lot of us. And it took quite a little while to get the class calmed down again after that. And maybe one of the true marks of her success was that one of her students named his rootster after her. Who else among us has had that honor? <laughs> As I mentioned, she liked to sing. She came by this right. We all like to sing. This might be one of her stories, but she told it this way, and I think it's true. As they were on a car trip, you know, before maybe I joined them, or even after, and they started to fight in the back seat about who was sitting on whose part of the seat, probably. When they'd start to fight, Dad would start to sing, and Mom would join in, and soon all of them were happily singing as they went down the road. Our family all loved to sing. I think we're pretty good at it, too. After Ruth and Bob were married, turns out Bob's a singer, too. He likes to sing, and I know, and I've heard it, that they had a really good rendition of the Lord's Prayer. Ruth was good at friendship, and she brought her friends to our house. Friends were an important facet of Ruth's life. She had so many. Ruthie Knudsen, who you just heard from, Joyce Fisher on Ada Street, Mary Jo Kukuk, and a raft of other friends in high school. College and marriage brought more friends into her life and very often ours. Mary Putnam Wood was while well, she was teaching up at Barrington. So many laughs. Carol Rard and Kathy Burdick on the hill in Blanchard. And after returning to live by Lake Michigan, Mary Jo and Sue Miller pro proved to be solid friends and tremendous help. She was a good friend to many, and she had many good friends. Like my other sisters and our mom, Ruth was a welcoming hostess for all kinds of gatherings. We were frequently at her home. Bob's home for birthdays, Christmas. When Pete finished his PhD, Ruth and Bob gave a lovely party to celebrate. It was a wonderful gift to him and us. Whatever the reason, there was a lot of laughs, cribbage, trivial pursuit, great food, and the best eula kaka, krum kaka, and sambakas. <laughs> she was a great storyteller. Ruth mentioned this. There were always stories in my family 
sometimes we call it the begats now. It was, as you might understand it, who lived where, who married whom, and how they might be related to us. Listen carefully today, and you might hear some of those conversations. Other stories, too, about growing up, sharing a room with Joan and Judy, her experiences in college, her interesting professors and her friends, stories about teaching, teacher, teaching and later descriptive and funny emails. Her stories and our stories were important to us as they tell us who we are. You'll hear one of those stories in just a couple minutes. A few days before she died, I spent a few hours sitting next to her bed at Grand Pines. She was very agitated, but not responding to anything I said or did. She was talking, but most of what she said was not understandable except for three different things. First, in a string of exasperated muttering, I distinctly heard her quietly say, I want to go home. Yes, Ruth, I said, you're on your way home. Mom and Dad are waiting for you there. She did not respond. A little while later, seemingly distressed and confused, Ruth called out, Bob. How often we'd heard her call for Bob as she became more and more confused in the last year. She relied on Bob to fix whatever she needed fixed, to explain what, was, what needed to be explained, and I know it was a difficult and a sad duty for Bob. Throughout the difficulties and much of what Ruth was lost, she still called out for Bob. And then, near the time I was going to leave her, she turned her head and looked at me. She seemed a bit surprised that I was there. I think I knew she, I think she knew who I was. I said, well, hello, I came to visit you. She responded as clearly as she ever did. Wonderful. It was the last thing I ever heard her say, and how fitting for Ruth. She used the word wonderful frequently. If it was happy hour, wonderful. <laughs> Going out to dinner, wonderful. Planning a trip, wonderful. Friends coming over, wonderful. I hope you can hear her saying it. I know I can. Finally, and I think you'll all agree, what a brilliant way to wrap up all the things Ruth was to us. Daughter, sister, wife, friend, teacher, neighbor, wonderful. I think you, Joan, will come and read. Hello. Wow. Wonderful. Ruth had wanted to write this book, and I think she had the words already written. But when she'd have Ruth, um, Aunt Ruth Campground, Julie Hitchcock, Lindsay Hitchcock, Philip Joslin, and Charlotte DeConing were there. And she had them do the illustrations in the book, and then she chose what went with each of them. So I hope you enjoy it as much as the rest of us had. It's quite an insight as to Gary and Blanche's children, maybe. I see the lake. When I was young and living near Lake Michigan, we went to the beach for breakfast. Mother would fire up our Coleman stove and fry bacon and eggs. Sometimes we ate puffed rice or Cheerios. After we ate, my brother and I might climb a sand dune. The dune grass would cut our feet, so we chose our paths carefully. In the late afternoon when Dad got home from work, Mother would pack up the Coleman stove again and we would go to the lake for supper. Before we left home, we would struggle our bodies into our still damp bathing suits and sit on a towel in the back seat. As we neared the lake, our necks stretch out almost into the front seat to yell, I see the lake. Somebody usually lied about it. We ran to the water hearing warning yells of, don't go in too deep. We were busy yelling, last one in is a rotten egg. Seconds later, we were having stand on your head contest and staying under the longest contest and going out the deepest and still touching contest. When I was young and living near Lake Michigan, 
we would at least once a year go camping on another Lake Michigan beach. Once in a while, we would even venture to Lake Huron or Lake Superior, but they were either too rocky or too cold for our narrow-minded vision of a great lake. Unknowingly, our parents had molded us into Lake Michigan snobs. <laughs> when I was young and living near Lake Michigan on hot summer nights, we might pile in the car to watch the sun slowly sink into the lake. It was usually a fairly quiet moment of softening yellows and oranges. I would silently thank God that my family didn't live in Grand Rapids or Lansing or even worse, Kansas. <laughs> Before heading home, we would swim in the lake after dark when the water was usually warmer than the air. Our floating heads with blue lips would start hinting that an ice cream cone at Knutson's Dairy Bar would taste so good. Sitting on towels in the back seat, licking ice cream cones and smelling like seaweed, we knew we were the richest kids in the world. It's one of the little pictures. They're so cute. When I was young and living near Lake Michigan, my parents taught us by example to respect and love our world and our lives. For breakfast at the beach, seaweed smell, sunsets, and sand dunes. When I am older, I may be living near Lake Michigan. strategize the plan back there and just wing it by two seconds you understand now uh, why I fell in love with Ruth it wasn't just the fact of her but it was you know the <coughs> family that came with it uh, and believe me I thought she was a Hollander uh, little did I know and but when I after I had dated Ruth long enough, I came in the back door of the house. You know, when, you're, when you get to be that stage and you can go in the back door? Uh, anyway, and I came upstairs, and Blanche was there uh, making meatballs. And I made the worst mistake in the world. I said, oh, Swedish meatballs for dinner. I got an abrupt, no, they're Norwegian meatballs. <laughs> and I said to her, what makes them Norwegian meatballs? A Norwegian made them. <laughs> <coughs> That's, you, you know, the family. Anyway, I picked the pieces and of music. They're different. They didn't play the last one, which was also the association's never my love. But that kind of sums up what Ruth and I bonded with over in the mid-60s. I'm going to go back a little bit and thank you ladies for bringing everyone up to knowing what Ruth was like and I think we all knew it. But if you lived in the east side of Muskegon, better known as Hollander Town, 
the out NIM school district was the Norwegian, and we had sections all over Muskegon. But anyway, everybody knew each other. Ruth and I really met each other when we were in junior high school. Uh, we enjoyed going to McGray Field and skating on usually on Wednesday night. The tactic was I would go to catechism at Unity Church. My skates were around my neck. And as we went from our private classes to the joint meeting, they went left and I went right. <laughs> and I would be down the street about four blocks at McCray. And that's where Ruth would be with her friends. You know, they went to the other school in town, West Michigan Christian. That was okay. We did that in our junior high years. We had a great time. It was in February, last weekend in February of 1966. We had, Ruth and I hadn't seen much of each other even in the uh, confines of East Muskegon, but we knew of each other. I was out at Sorrento's on a Saturday night. I guess I had acquired a understanding that I always dated a lot of girls. Well, I was there without a date that weekend. I was there with a couple friends of mine. We were seated in the back of the restaurant. We had made our order, and I saw four girls come in and sat in the front. I said to the guys, I know those girls. I'm going to go up and say hi to them. They did not know because they had all gone to West Michigan Christian. And you know, they didn't know each other. So I went up. There was Joyce. There was Pat. There's Mary Jo. And here's Ruth. I said my hi to them, and we talked briefly. Refreshing old memories. And I f food was served at my table, so I went back. My friends at the table said, I, don't bet, I bet you you don't have a date with one of those girls by next weekend. <laughs> In our conversation, Ruth had pointed out that she was working at Hasselman's Food Market, as many of the deconing families did, the, at least the first older four, the, the, the rookies on the bottom got out of it. Uh, and so it was Wednesday afternoon, and after I got out, out of work at Vets, I drove over to Hasselman, surprised Ruth that I came in. She was in the baby food area, stocking shelves. I said I didn't need any baby food, but I was just wondering if you'd like to go out Saturday night. Surprisingly, she said yes. So the Saturday night comes. And if you, again, I, the Dutch background, my mother, every time I would go out with a different girl, she said, who are you going out with? I said, oh, mom, you don't know her. She's, you know, over on the other side of town. Mother was very concerned, of course, of the religious background of the girls that I was taking out. So I said to my mom, oh, you don't know her. A girl named Ruth DeConey. To which I got a response. Oh, that's Gary and Blanche's daughter. Yeah. My mother and Ruth's mother, father rather, were about one month apart in age. And if you lived in the Dutch community, they were only about four blocks most away from each other as they grew up. Undoubtedly, they knew each other. So anyway, that Saturday night, I went over to pick up Ruth. Walked in, and I'm now introduced to Gary and Blanche. We had a great night, one of those typical nights. I loved to bowl. I took her bowling. We went to the Muske Michigan Lanes downtown Muskegon, which is now gone. We had fun. We laughed. She was a little shy, I would say, but her shell started cracking a little bit. So afterwards, we went out to a restaurant at the airport. It was a small restaurant owned by Lakos that had their big restaurant downtown, but they had this delightful little restaurant in the airport. 
I had taken a few other young ladies out there and I knew it was some good food and it was a quiet place. So as we entered, Ruth said, oh, I don't know what I want. I said, well, I, I enjoy their steak sandwich. Choice of potatoes and a salad. Ruth said, that sounds good. So when we ordered, the waitress said, ma'am, what kind of salad dressing do you want? Ruth looked at me and gave me this very disgruntled look. Salad dressing. We only have mayo and milk. <laughs> I said, okay, try Thousand Island. She ate Thousand Island dressing for the next 20 years. <laughs> uh, it was interesting day. So after we had left there, we were driving home in my little four-door Fiat. You know, it's a white car, white dash, and I had a, a key chain, not a key chain, but a key pouch, leather key pouch. Keys in the middle of the ignition. And we're driving down the street at Wood Street, now across from where it used to be, Church of the Open Door. Ruth reaches up and says, what's this? Click. <laughs> I said, that would be the ignition. So I'm starting now to question a little bit. We made it to her house successfully after starting the car and we sat in the f driveway for a few moments talking, you know, first dates and that's not bad. So I opened the door for her and walked her to Gary's very well painted green steps on the front of 654. She took one step up and turned around and the pleasantries Lo and behold, she reached out and gave me a kiss. Whoa, okay. I didn't think that would happen. I left her after she got in the house. I got in my car and drove the, mag you know, the huge, I think it was five blocks back to my house. Somewhere in that route, I'm starting to say, yeah, she's okay. She's okay. So, uh, of course, we dated. Through the summer, we did double dates with a lot of people. I was just with Ann and Mark Jepson recently, and Ann and, and Ruth were very good friends. We went, the four of us went to a hockey game downtown. And somewhere in the middle of it, the ladies excused themselves and went to the restroom. And Ann just told me a couple of weeks ago, it was at that time that Ruth conveyed to her I just don't know about this guy. <laughs> Thank you, Ann, for saying, give it time, give it time. <laughs> Later, you know, we went through the summer, and I would drive in from Camp Owasipi where I cooked or worked in the kitchen. Larry and I would come in together, and we would then go out. And at the end of the summer, we were out at Dave Buckham's parents' house out on Lake Harbor Road, and at, in junior college, we belonged to a group called the Men's Union, which was a kind of a service organization and a knockoff uh, fraternity. We didn't want to pledge to a fraternity. So we, we did a lot of service work. We put together for the closing of the summer a nice dinner. All the friends were there. And after we got done doing the dinner, we cleaned up the house a little bit. I found the last beer in the refrigerator. I took the last beer. I was enjoying it tremendously. Took a drink, put it down the table. And at that time they had cigarettes, I don't even remember the name, but they had a little drop of fluid in the filter so it purified your smoke if you could do that. Ruth looks at the cigarette that someone had there and she says, Oh, such and such a name. I wonder her clothes. She puts it down in the bottle neck. <laughs> Let me remind you, that was the last beer in the house. <laughs> Mark said to me a couple of weeks ago, he said, the look you had on your face. They were questioning whether she would live the night. Anyway, we made up for that, that evening. So a couple of weeks after that, I went off to Central Michigan in Mount Pleasant. 
first time now in almost nine months I had not been with Ruth. And that was a strange feeling all of a sudden. You know, there was something building between the two of us. I always scheduled my classes so I would uh, do early morning classes. I hate afternoon classes. It was 8, 10, and 12. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then a t one class on Tuesdays, always in the morning. Between classes, I would go to the union and have a cup of coffee and do some studying. That was in 66, and Cherish was the song of the day. I mean, if you're in there for an hour, it was played four times. <laughs> they loved it. And I'm thinking, I love that song. Then I realized a thousand other guys could be after Ruth, too. <laughs> and I wasn't there to watch. So I would purchase cards, humorous cards, send her at least two cards a week. Then I would come home on the weekend and sell clothes at Vets. So I got home, went in the house, threw on a tie, went downtown to Vets, and we worked until 9 o'clock at night. I would get in the car, drive over to 654 Catawba, and there was Gary sitting at the kitchen table, smoking a cigarette, and the cribbage board was on the table. I would give Ruth a kiss or two on the way through, and to be my father-in-law later, we played cribbage. Three games. We always had to make sure that we knew the winner of the night. That went on for a number of weeks until one night Ruth looked at me when I came out to the living room. She said, why the heck am I staying home on Friday night? I could be out with my friends having fun. I got to wait for you. That did. She spoke earnestly, and I got the point. Anyway, went well. And I found out that she did have some backbone to tell me. In 1967, she followed me up to Mount Pleasant. I don't know if she followed me, but she came up there, so we weren't apart from each other. And we were constantly during a little bit of the week, but always in the weekend. And uh, that was when the second song that wasn't played, Never My Love, came out. And that was a commitment to never leave. During our dating in not Mount Pleasant, we never discussed marriage. Well, we did, but I never asked her to marry me. We just assumed or we knew that it was going to happen. We even went out and purchased her wedding ring and diamond together. She's going to wear it. She can pick it up. It all was going good. I lived with a gentleman, and I use that term loosely, Bob Bulow, and he was dating Linda. And the four of us spent many weekends together. Bob loved to make tuna salad or tuna casserole. Ruth referred to it as cat, cat food casserole. <laughs> there was some uh, differences between them. Anyway, both of the couples went home that uh, th yeah Thanksgiving, and at that time, unbeknownst to each other, we both chose out what day of the year we were going to get married. Got back. The girls were excited about it, and then they made the announcement to each other. We were both going to get married on August 24th. That saved Bob and I from going to each other's wedding and crying. <laughs> it was a long time, folks. The next year we got married. And as other ones have spoken, we had a great family. I watched Sana could have been here today. We were going to FaceTime her and let her go, but tomorrow we're going to send her the video. I've got two beautiful daughters, four beautiful granddaughters, and I've even survived living with all those women. We were together. We dated for 58 years 
and three months. It was the longest date I ever did because when I took her out, I was 19. When I got the kiss from her in at like 10 after 12 in the morning, I had turned 20. So now I know when we got together. It's easy to remember your birthday. So throughout the years, I've lived with those, those two songs. We cherished each other, and I eliminated the competition, <laughs> and we never left each other. Even though I, you know, in disagreements that every married couple has, I would say, do you want me to leave? I never got an answer yes. That's what we have had for 58 years of dating and 55 and a half years of marriage. I want to thank you all for coming today. I, was, I had said to Craig when we were discussing this, I said, oh, yeah, it's going to be a small group, you know, like 120. And I think we surpassed that. Thank you all for coming, and thank you all for your beautiful notes of condolences, both on Facebook and in mail. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Jane to come up and just give a brief prayer of departure, and after that we're going to have the third most favorite song that Ruth and I have, and that's from the St. Olaf Choir in uh, North, yeah, what is it, uh, Minnesota. Uh, Ruth's, Ruth J's daughter, Kristen, went up there, and the four R's went up two or three years in a row to listen to and get indoctrinated to the Norwegian smell of bad fish. <laughs> and uh, we walked through that, but it was one of the most beautiful services you ever heard. And they would conclude this, the performance by the choirs. They had five choirs. They all came off the stage and they encircled the audience, and then they sang Beautiful Savior. And when you got done, you could hear a pin drop. It was the most beautiful thing you can have. And that, Ruthie loved it tremendously. I'll ask Pastor Jane to come up, and afterwards, please join us in the family room. I think there's some food and beverage for us, and a lot of chit-chat, and reconnecting with a lot of folks. Thanks for coming. Jane? I'll just leave that there. You ask me if there'll come a time when I grow tired of you. Let's take a big deep breath. Won't be long, okay? <laughs> we heard a lot of good things, didn't we? A lot of love, a lot of living, a lot of giving back to society through teaching, through literature, these stories for children. It has been a gift. She had a zest for all of you, for life, for her home, her work, her travels, her faith. And now her living, breathing spirit that was amongst us is now living and breathing in a new dimension. Isn't that exciting? You know, Ruth's passing reminds us that life is, is temporary. Um, if we were to define our life um, as a human on planet Earth, we could say that we are wanderers. We are just wandering through. We're just traveling through. All of our lives are different, of course. You know, they're, they're not alike, but similar. For many of us, we have uh, met a lot of people, various kinds of people, but we've only truly loved probably a few. 
We've lived in a lot of places, different styles of homes or condos or apartments. Um, we've shared some good food with friends. We've had some memorable experiences and we've heard all about those memorable experiences or how they were experienced by her. And then there have been these wonderful benchmark moments, those moments where we knew they, they made a difference, a big difference in our life. And then hopefully, there's been a reasonable amount of fulfillment in all of our work and in all of our leisure time. You know, most of us have prayed and pleaded with God at one time or another at a difficult moment. Um, and then in those happy moments, we've given a lot of songs of praise because that's what we humans do. And after that, we've mer emerged just a little bit stronger with a little more wisdom. But somewhere along the line, we gained a nagging perspective that we don't dare to just settle in and get too comfortable because the miles of life get long and the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune can attack us at any point. And then surprisingly, all of the big attractions that we have found so great and we plan for, we save our money for, just suddenly, suddenly, you know, it's just another trip. It's just another event. And no matter how great our friendships are, how pleasant their hospitality is, at the end of the day, we begin to wonder, is there something more besides this? Is there something more? And especially, especially as we age or we become infirmed or, or we acquire a disease that, that really lays us low or we're grieving over a precious loss. I mean, we begin to think, surely there's another place where no tears will dim the eye. There's another place where we'll be able to run and not grow weary. In 1919, a 14-year-old boy who had grown up picking cotton in the fields wanted to be a songwriter, and there was a song that was just going through this young boy's mind, and finally he put it to a pen and pencil and uh, paper and he wrote, this world is not my home. I'm just a traveling crew. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Sound familiar? The angels beckon me from heaven's open doors, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. A 14-year-old thought that. Ruth understood that. And at a very young age, she began paving the way to her eternal home. It showed in her life. Sometimes it shone so brightly. Other times it was just flickering. But always that glow, that light in her life reflected God's love. Well, Ruth is traveling again, isn't she? She's greeting those infant boys and old family and friends, and she's meeting all the hosts of heaven. Imagine with me the words of an unknown author. I am standing upon the seashore. A ship is at my side, and it's spreading her white wings in the morning breeze, and it starts the ocean. Ah, she's an object of beauty and strength. She stands, moves so graciously, and I watch until the very end when 
she hangs like a speck of a cloud between the sky and the sea, which come down to mingle together. And then someone from my side says, there, she's gone. Gone? Gone where? Gone from my sight, that is all. She is just as large in mass and hull and spar as she was when she left my side, and just as able to bear her load of living freight to the place of her destination. Her diminished size is in me, not in her. Just at the moment when someone on my side says, there, she's gone, there are other voices who are taking up the glad shout, there she comes. This vibrant spirit is now home. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, your love never ends. When all else in our earthly life and flesh fail, you still are a loving and compassionate God. And Ruth knew that and is now experiencing your eternal loving presence. But we confess that we knew her physical loss, and we will know it for time to come, and that causes us to suffer. So we pray for each other in our need, especially Rob, Anne, and David, Donna, the children, and all the extended family and all those who mourn this day. Embrace each with your presence of comfort and strength. The love that is being offered to each other right now is a priceless gift, O oh God. May it continue in the days ahead, blessing our lives over and over again as Ruth's well-lived life continues to speak to us of God's love. And now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you this hour, this day, and in the days ahead. Amen.